New reporting this morning, CNN has learned that the U.S. is developing contingency plans for possible Russian escalation in its war in Ukraine, including the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. Also the possibility of what one source described as a nuclear display, that would be something short of a nuclear strike, including the possibility of a military strike on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Joining me now to discuss Retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, he's former Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs, also former Deputy Director for Plans and Strategy at U.S. CENCOM. General, good to have you on this morning. Hi, Jim. How are you? So this shows how seriously the U.S. is taking these Russian nuclear threats. They've been developing contingency plans for some time. I wonder, can you describe what such contingency plans might involve? Well, I think, first of all, there's the, the public uh, face of all of this, which is how we communicate to Russia uh, what we're prepared to do, what we're not prepared to do. Mm. Uh, my personal view is I think we ought to be deliberately vague on what we are prepared to do. Uh, anytime you draw a red line, uh, that, that uh, commits you to a certain course of action. Look, I think it's fairly simple to uh, lay down the options. It could be uh, the soft side of it, which is doubling down on sanctions, doubling mm -hmm. down on export controls, uh, ranging all the way to a, a nuclear response of our own and everything in between. Wow. Uh, it would be likely that uh, this president is not looking at the far end of that, sort of looking at a uh, response in kind, but not with nuclear weapons. Hard Understood. strikes on Russian facilities in, uh, inside of uh, Ukraine, most likely. That's exactly how General Petraeus uh, described it. Uh, he said, hypothetically, and again, he's not basing this on any public you know, revelation of intelligence, uh, we would respond by leading a NATO collective effort that would take out every Russian conventional force that we could see and identify on the battlefield in Ukraine, also in Crimea. D does that sound like uh, the response you, you'd be thinking of? Well, I certainly don't uh, have a vote in the matter, but I think that's certainly mm -hmm. one of the options they'd be considered, and I'm glad to see I'm in good company as they betray us. Let me ask you this then, because a concern from the start of this war, which has you know, qualified really every U.S. NATO step in response to the Russian invasion, the, the, the quality of weapons, the range of weapons, the, de the, yep. the, the degree of military support for Ukraine, has been concerns about sparking a broader war with Russia. For instance, that's why the idea of a no-fly zone was limited, because that would be putting NATO warplanes in direct conflict with Russian forces. Uh, would a response like this, I mean, and this has to be part of the calculation, right? I mean, there's a risk of sparking a broader war, is there not? Uh, there certainly is. Uh, but I heard a description of Putin yesterday that I thought was particular at, particularly apt. He started off as a autocrat, became a dictator, and now he's a madman. Wow. Uh, he may be a madman, but I don't think he's suicidal. I don't believe that he wants to be the leader of Russia that ends the Russian Federation. So mm -hmm. I think we ought to take his uh, threats seriously, but I don't think we should be cowed or coerced into any particular action as a result. And I should note, and this is in our story this morning, that the U.S. to date has not detected any movements of Russian nuclear forces or weapons that would yeah. indicate that, 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 that such an attack is, is, is imminent. Uh, I, I do want to talk about the battlefield right now and Ukrainian progress because we saw that rapid advance in the Northeast at the start of this counteroffensive. Yeah. Now we're seeing, if not quite rapid advance, but still substantial advance in the South around Kherson. How bad is the situation for Russia and its forces? Is, is this, has, have we seen the beginning of a broader retreat here? That's hard to say, Jim, uh, because if you look at it from classic military analysis, the Russians should be doing far, far better. A quantitative mm. assessment says that the Russians have the advantage. But it's the intangibles that we're seeing on the battlefield, the morale of the Ukrainians, the equipment they have, the leadership that they have, versus the exact opposite on the side of the Russians. I don't think you can take a conventional military ruler and measure this as well as, as may have been in the past. Uh, I don't particularly think there's going to be a breakout anytime soon, but there will be continued pressures on the Russians, both in the North and the South. Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, good to have you on this morning. Thanks so much. The New York Times reporting this.
In background conversations, a range of officials suggested that if Russia detonated a tactical nuclear weapon on Ukrainian soil, the options included unplugging Russia from the world economy or some kind of military response, the one that would most likely be delivered by the Ukrainians with Western-provided conventional weapons. Joining us now, one of the reporters behind this story, CNN political and national security analyst David Sanger. This is such a great story, I think, because it really puts us in the moment that we're in, which is kind of an alarming one, although you also do point out, for instance, that there are some reasons why senior officials are saying not to be fully concerned at this point in time. But just put into context where we are. Well, I think where we are, Brianna, is that this is probably one of the most fraught nuclear moments since the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was 60 years ago this month. Um, that said, there's no evidence right now that we see the Russians moving any tactical weapons. They're small, so it might be easy to miss them, but there is no evidence of that uh, at this point. And they don't believe that Putin yet has his back so up against the wall that he would turn to this. It's also not entirely clear how much using a tactical weapon would help him on the battlefield, except to try to freeze things, to basically say to the Ukrainians, if you make one more move toward throwing us out of the Donbass or these other areas, just know that I can take out your entire country and, and turn it all into wasteland. Um, but the consequences for Putin would be high. And, and David, surely Putin knows among those consequences would be global condemnation, right. that you know, there are still some countries that he has somewhat on his side, uh, including China. He must know that he would very quickly lose that support if he were to do anything on the nuclear front. I think that's right, Alex. He would. And, uh, you know, China and India are two countries that are continuing to buy oil, for example, and not part of the, the major sanctions regime. At the same time, what worries most American officials is what happens when Putin comes to the conclusion that the war is going so badly that it's an existential threat not only to Russia, but to him and to his own rule. And at that moment, he may reach for whatever he has got. Uh, now, he may also think that over time, um, other countries have broken uh, taboos and gotten away with it. You notice it in the speech, the first thing that uh, the one last week, first thing he said was, there was Hiroshima, there was Nagasaki, and you set a precedent when you did that. Yeah, that is so alarming because that's part of what has been this campaign of rationalization, right? Where he's saying, oh, they set the precedent, the U.S. set the precedent. He's also, on this rationalization, had these illegal annexations of these four areas of Ukraine. And when you look at Russian military doctrine, and he keeps reemphasizing this, as have other Russian officials, nuclear weapons can be used if there is an existential threat to Russia. And now it seems to be the rationalization is, oh, well, this is Russia. So if you go after this, yeah, we can use a nuke. Right. That is the backwards rationalization. It would also seem to apply to Crimea. And of course, we've seen the Ukrainians attack Crimea, and he's not reached for nuclear weapons uh, at that moment. You know, the oddity of all of this, Brianna, is that nuclear weapons are one of those things that are much more powerful in the perspective, in the threat that you might use it, than they are when you actually go to off to use it. And this is not like the old Cold War days where the concern was they would lob a nuclear weapon at the United States, we, you know, and in return for New York, you'd take out Moscow or whatever. In this case, he's talking about using a small weapon that would be used on presumably a military base, maybe a low populated area. The West is not going to fire a nuclear weapon back in return for that. They may actually, as we reported, use conventional weapons. There could be some kind of a military response, but not a nuclear response. And so he may well think that, you know, over time, he would get away with this. He also thinks that over time, the West is going to lose interest in Ukraine, that as uh, the winter sets in in Europe, the interest in continuing the sanctions is going to diminish. You've already seen protests in Europe about high prices and, and shortages. So he's betting that we'll lose interest. 